Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to our 268th weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. Now, the way this call works is it's like Reddit. It's an AMA, ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, investing questions, startup questions, career questions, personal development questions, any questions you want to. And my humble goal is to help you take your career, portfolio, or company to the next level. Quick, quick uh, announcement here. So the next two weeks, there's not going to be a weekly call uh, because I'm going to be on vacation uh, in Florida uh, with, with my parents. I haven't seen them in a while. It'd be great to catch up with them. Also, um, tomorrow is the last day to get $1,000 off my next MBA degree program. And if you want, you can go to the link that you see there below. It's harunmba.com slash FAQ. Um, and let me go there with you. And when you go to this website, you can scroll down to see more details on the MBA program. So this one is $1,000 off, okay, at $14.99 if you click this coupon here. And this one here is $1,000 off at $24.99. Uh, again, the sale ends tomorrow and prices will be going up uh, on, uh, I think, this weekend. All right. And also in the corner, there's a blue button that I'm covering up, sorry. But if you want to schedule a Zoom call with me to discuss joining uh, my gold or platinum program or my new uh, diamond growth accelerator program um, please uh, click that button and set up a meeting all right uh, let's move on now to questions first up uh Interbun, great to see you as well rahul good morning rahul wrote um how are you i'm always great thanks hope you're doing well um, i have a question why is it that ultra high net worth individuals invest in a sports team like mark cuban does with the dallas mavericks yeah uh, a lot of times it's about ego because sports teams are not the best investments. And the reason I say that is because when you invest in a stock or a bond or real estate property, you can get cash payments from all of those in terms of a dividend, a coupon or rental income. When it comes to a sports team, it's a highly illiquid asset. You're not collecting money off of it. They're usually overpriced. And the only way to make money on it is to sell it many years from now and hopefully realize large capital gains. So why do people do this? Well, again, it's about ego. In fact, when I used to work in the hedge fund industry, uh, whenever I saw an entrepreneur or a founder of a large company that I was investing in buy a sports team, I might look to short the stock. Of course, I do more due diligence. But the reason I say that is because they take their eye off the ball. I always like to invest in entrepreneurs or CEOs or, or, or founders of companies that are all in. And a great example of taking your eye off the ball was with Elon Musk uh, back uh, a couple of years ago uh, when he bought Twitter, now called X. He really took his eye off the ball when it came to execution and new product announcements with Tesla. And investors punished Tesla because of that. So the bottom line is, whenever you see somebody invest in a sports team, an entrepreneur you've invested in, start to get worried because where there's smoke, there's fire uh, from um, an execution perspective. Okay. All right, next question is, how do you make a better judgment of the public market index, like overall fundamentals and technicals? Because I know stock market is manipulated by big institutions uh, and operators. Yeah. So what I would say is, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. That's a great quote from Warren Buffett. You really can't time the market. Nobody can. And that's why there's no successful day traders out there. They don't exist, otherwise we know their names. And if you invest short term and you try to trade, you'll get fooled by randomness because every single month, the market is open 20 days, 20 weekdays per month. And stocks go up and down for very random reasons. So we can't forecast that. Now, in terms of general market sentiment, what the whole world watches closely, the whole world watches the U.S. consumer. And the reason is because the U.S. economy is not only the largest economy in the world, but two-thirds of the gross domestic product, meaning revenue, of the United States is consumer spending. It's not big business. And so when the American consumer sneezes, so to speak, the rest of the world tends to feel it closely. So people watch uh, sentiment closely. Now, when I used to work in the hedge fund industry, we would look at mutual fund inflows and outflows as well. And you can do a search on this as well. And if you see massive mutual fund outflows in a given month, then a couple months later, quite often the market is down quite a bit. And the reason is it comes down to supply and demand. If a portfolio manager at Fidelity, for example, manages a billion dollar fund 
then this portfolio manager gets $100 million in redemptions. Then that portfolio manager has to sell $100 million worth of stock. So look at that from a supply-demand perspective uh, if you want to as well. What I also used to look at was gold. Now, when I worked in the hedge fund industry in the morning meetings before uh, the markets opened, we would always talk about sentiment indicators like the price of gold. And the reason is, and this is fake, the reason is because when investors buy a lot of gold, and it's not always perfectly correlated, but when they buy gold and gold starts to spike, then what that means is people are worried about the market because this is certainly a flight to quality. The last thing we look at is called the VIX, V-I-X. And let me show you a quick chart of this. Um, and I'm going to put my reputation on the line here by saying this is the most important factor to analyze when deciding when to back up the truck or buy tons of shares in more risky companies. So the VIX is a, a volatility index. Let me go here to, whoops, let's go here to finance.yahoo.com and never pay for any financial information. Get all the stuff free from finance.yahoo.com. Uh, so I'm going to type here the VIX. I'm going to explain this as well. So the VIX was created by the Chicago Board of Exchange back in 1990. And the VIX is a volatility index. And what volatility means is fear. Okay. So when the VIX spikes to a high level, meaning above 60, 70, or 80, and you can't see it intraday, but it did reach those levels twice. When the VIX reaches 70 or 80, that means there's maximum fear in the market. And that's when you should back up the truck and buy more risky stocks. Now, what the VIX is, is it measures the volatility, meaning options volume, on the S&P 500 stocks over a month period or so. And every chart tells a story. And so the VIX was launched in 1990. We saw a bit of an uptick here with Gulf War I. Over here, we saw another uptick here with the um, Asian financial crisis. Uh, they call it the, the Asian flu back then. Up here is when we were worried about inflation, um, and then um, uh, Alan Greenspan cut interest rates here materially. Right here, of course, uh, was 9-11. Uh, this here was 2008, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working. And this here was the COVID crisis. And in March of 2020, the VIX, the volatility index, actually spiked to an all-time high, you can't see it here, above 80. And when that happens, that means maximum fear. In order to make money, the best quality you can possibly have is to be unemotional and to be a contrary. You got to buy when there's blood in the streets or be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy, as Warren Buffett says. So the bottom line message with this VIX chart here is if and when, if and when you see the VIX spike to above 70 or 80, then no matter what, do not sell. Accumulate shares if you can. And you're going to think at that point, when the VIX, and it'll get there again within the next decade, it usually gets there once or twice a decade. When the VIX spikes to above 70 or 80, you're going to think to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm crazy to be buying stocks. That's when you buy because everybody else is freaking out. In fact, uh, Elon Musk, who's very unemotional, which is one of the many reasons he's successful. Elon Musk, back in March of 2020, when everybody was selling every stock on the planet and the price of oil, the futures price of oil went to negative 20, which is highly irrational. What Elon Musk did, and this is all publicly disclosed, what he did was he bought a ton of shares in Tesla because it was getting murdered. And then he sold those shares in Tesla in late 2021, six weeks before the market peaked in, in January of 2022. And so you have to be a contrarian and buy what everyone else is freaking out. And if you want, what you can do is there's something called behavioral finance. And behavioral finance is trying to understand when insiders buy and sell and how that correlates to the future stock price. What you can do is you can look at Form 4 filings on SEC.gov, which basically means insider selling. And you can run a regression analysis, mean see if a lot of insider selling by C-level executives, CEOs, CFOs, if that means that six or 12 months later, the stock went down. And you can do this in Microsoft Excel. You can actually use artificial intelligence or machine learning in Excel by looking at a regression analysis. And that's why I teach my MBA degree program. You can find out more details right here. Now, what makes the VIX spike is usually something you can't forecast. It's usually a black swan. And this is a great book by uh, Nicholas, uh, Nassim Nicholas uh, Taleb, Lebanese guy. I'm quarter Lebanese, represent. And basically, a black swan means a rare event because there aren't many, many black swans. 
And so what causes the VIX to spike materially is an event that we can't forecast. Similarly, what leads to irrational volatility in a stock in a short amount of time, and the reason you can't day trade, is quite often irrational or unexpected events, and you, in effect, get fooled by randomness, which is the title of another great book by Taleb. Okay. Um, next up, uh, Ryan wrote here, um, hey, Chris, it's great to join another live, live stream. Great to see you as well. I'm so sorry I won't be here for the next two weeks. You wrote, uh, why did gold drop so much in 2012 and 2013? And where do you see ticker GLD, which is the gold ETF that was launched in 2004? Where do you see uh, gold going in the near term and long term? I'm trying to construct a balanced portfolio. Yeah. So I usually have about, and do your own research, please, but I usually have about 5% of my liquid net worth uh, in gold. And sometimes I scale a little bit more when I'm worried about the markets. Now, the reason that, that gold actually fell uh, in 2012 and 13, because it was a re-risking trade. And what that means is this. In 2008, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working, what I did was I made my largest position in my fund gold because I was really worried about the market and I had to deploy capital. I had to own something. And so a lot of people piled into gold as well in 2008. In 2009 and 10, people were still worried about the markets. 2011, we had a bit of a flash crash. And then people really started to re-risk, meaning put back on the risk trade in 2012 and 13. Right? And it's all about supply and demand. So I get rid of this product. Supply increases, price goes down. And I put it into more risky stocks. So it was part of a, a, a re-risking trade, meaning people putting risk back on. Yeah. So in the near term, where's gold going? I don't know. I never know. Nobody knows. Nobody can predict the market in the near term. In the long run, gold is going up. And the reason I say that uh, is, is, and this is not rocket science, is because there's a scarcity in gold. I love to invest in things where there's a limit in terms of supply, and I know that demand will increase in the long run. So the price of oil, for example, when it comes to commodities, oil, yes, it's a limited resource, but it's going to be cannibalized by clean tech longer term. When it comes to gold, it's a limited resource and people are going to want it more in the future. And anything you invest in, you always want to look at supply closely. And my grandfather, and Mr. Grips, used to always tell me, Chrissy, buy land. They're not making it anymore. And I'm releasing a, a real estate elective exclusive to my MBA program students uh, this fall. And so if you sign up for my MBA degree program, you'll get that elective for free. All right. Um, next up, Rahul, Rahul wrote, uh, is there any way to be a step ahead uh, of the market? Uh, how to gain the psychology and sentiment knowledge of stock market that very few people have? Thanks and God bless you. God bless you more. Thank you. So it's impossible. You can't be one step ahead of the market if you're short-term focused. You can be one giant leap. Uh, that's Neil Armstrong. One giant leap ahead of the market if you're long-term focused and if you're a contrary. And what I mean by that is only buy when people are freaking out, right? When the relative strength index reaches 20, meaning it's oversold. That's technical analysis. I can go there if you want me to. And also think long-term. So for example, if you're short-term focused and you bought Coca-Cola the year it went public many years ago, one year later, you're down 50%. But if you just held on and you did your research and you love the fundamentals, the valuation, et cetera, you make a gazillion percent in the long run. And so you really have to be long-term focused. And it's a little silly how, and I'm being self-critical here too, how we tend to watch the markets. You know, it's like a Jedi mind trick. You can't will it to go higher or lower any stocks you have. You got to think longer term. And always tell yourself this. I don't know the path, but I know the destination, meaning your target price. And so if you look at the S&P 500, yeah, it's volatile sometimes. But the chart looks like this in the long run. So you buy here and you hold it forever. Don't worry about that crap in the middle. You'll, you'll sleep better. I don't know the path, but I know the destination. In fact, if all you did was you took your $22,000 or whatever it is, and I know times are tough, you can't always do this. But if you took your 22 k or whatever it is and, and put in your 401k every year and or retirement savings program, different countries, and you put in the S&P 500, ticker VOO, then what would happen is if you did that every year, in 20 years, you will have over a million dollars and you'll sleep well at night and that's tax-free as well until you take the money out of your 401k. 
Now, the S&P 500 is up about 15% on average per year. Of course, there's big up years and massive down years as well. But you can sleep at night knowing that your portfolio is going to go up in 20 years if you just buy and hold. Really important to do. Now, if all you did was you and your spouse put in your 401k into the VU every year, right, 22k or whatever it is each, then in 20 years, you'd have over $2 million. And for those of you that uh, have kids, what I recommend doing if you can, and we can't do this every year because times are tough, is I recommend maxing out your educational savings account for your kids, meaning your, 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 um, uh, your, your five, uh, 529. And so what you can do is you can put 15 or 16K per year per kid. And of course, we can't do it every year. But if all you did was you took that 15K per year for one kid, then over 18 years, that's 700K. Do it for three kids, that's 2.1K. Add the $2 million you've saved for yourself and your spouse, you're worth over $4 million. And the beautiful thing about an educational savings account is that your kids, and I'm going through this now, uh, my, my son Andrew's going to third year Berkeley, this guy finds out today which universities he gets into. But what your kids can do is they can take that money out tax-free to pay for education. Or what they can do is they can take that money out when they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever it is, to buy a house. And of course, they'll pay taxes then. So always spend what is left after saving. Don't save what is left after spending. All right, next question is from Motivation Station. How are you? Uh, who wrote, Chris, how do you access the chat bot uh, on your website? Yeah, so I made a chat bot uh, using ChatGPT. I disabled it only because on my website, <clears throat> and I designed my website myself. I'm a nerd. I love doing that stuff. I put a little blue button that says, that says click me if you want to set up a Calendly call with Chris. I'll put it back up soon. But if any of you want to start a chat bot at your company, what you can always do is this. It's really, really cheap. You go to chatbase.co. Then you can pay 20 bucks a month or get the free plan if you want. Pay 20 bucks a month. And what you can do is you can upload as many sources as you want. And so what I do with my chatbot was I uploaded ton, like 11 million characters of, of, of FAQs and, 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 and transcripts from my MBA program. And then what you do is, it's really easy to set up. You copy this iframe code or this JavaScript code down here, and you paste it uh, into the HTML uh, on your website. It's really, really easy to do. Yeah, I'll put it back up soon. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay, and then Rahul, uh, another Rahul wrote, it's been a long time since I joined. How are you? I'm great, thank you. And I, and I hope you're doing well as well. All right, next up, we got MS. Uh, first time I've seen you on the call. Hope you join us again. Thank you who wrote, rather than putting your money into a savings account that pays very little interest these days, would you suggest setting aside money every month to be invested in ETF such as the Vanguard S&P 500? Absolutely. Now, only invest after you've done your due diligence, of course. And I'll go there in a second and talk about the stock or the, the ticker uh, VOO, which is the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF. And if you're not sure where to put your money, what I do at least, and again, do your own research, please, is I love to put my money in the SB 500. And the reason is because the very last company, so to speak, on this planet that would ever go bankrupt is the US government. And so it's all relative when you invest. Currencies are relative, stocks are relative, bonds are relatives, everything's relative. And that's why I put my money in the S&P 500. Yeah. And the great thing about investing in large US companies is you're also getting international exposure because the larger cap American companies have 50 or 60% sometimes of their annual revenue from overseas. So let, let me show you the ticker here. So never buy mutual funds are an absolute scam, okay? The fees, the hidden fees can sometimes be as high as 5%. It's a joke. The reason mutual funds are still relevant is because they have great relationships with HR in lots of companies and also because they spend billions of dollars every year advertising. So this right here is the VU. Okay. And Vanguard is the best ETF company ever. And because they're so big, they can charge low fees. It's economies of scale. It's like the Walmart effect. And if we scroll down here, and this expense ratio is, is wrong here, but it says 14.14, which means for every 100 bucks you invest, you only pay 14 cents in fees every year. 
unlike a mutual fund, which underperforms the S&P, where the fees and hidden fees can be 3, 4, or 5%, meaning 300, 400, or 500 uh, basis points. This actually number is a little bit lower. And what's in this is just the S&P 500 components. And the biggest part of the S&P 500 uh, is, is tech. It's over 30%. It was 22% a year and a half ago. Tech stocks have gone up a lot. Okay. And if you guys want uh, to do your own research on what ETFs to invest in, the best website, and everything I recommend is free, the best website to use is etfdb.com. That's etfdatabase.com. Uh, you can screen by any type of ETF. There's 5,000 on this website. It's free to use. You can look at ETFs by geography, by crypto, et cetera. And one of the reasons that, that Bitcoin has been running up a lot uh, over the past couple of months or so, uh, and, and I still own a large position in my IRA, which I set up years ago. One of the reasons Bitcoin is rising a lot is because the SEC blessed uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency ETFs. Now, the way it worked in the past with cryptocurrencies was it was a nightmare. It was, it was a, so much friction involved in trying to buy cryptos. You had to use a Ledger Nano or any other cold storage wallet, enter in cryptic 12 passwords, whatever. And then once you got to the point where you wanted to place that order for Bitcoin or whatever crypto it is, you really didn't have much confidence in these things. And so you cut your order in half. And so what happened was the SEC said, hey, you're now allowed to create a Bitcoin uh, uh, ETF. And so all of a sudden, a lot of people thought, I don't have to worry about this crap anymore. I have more confidence investing in this asset class and I can get in and out as quickly as I want to. And it's as big of a deal as when the gold ETF was introduced back in 2004, GLD. In 2004, it became so much easier to buy gold because you can buy the ETF, which is very liquid, ticker GLD. And before then, I mean, what you had to do was, you know, go downtown and go to some shady store and try to buy gold bricks and you're not sure if they're real, etc. Then you had to put them in a safety deposit box. And what some people do and don't do this, I shouldn't even mention this, but I'm going to don't do this. What some people do is they buy gold for cash and they put it in a safety deposit box and then they take it out years later and they sell it for cash. They don't pay taxes. Don't do that. Okay. I don't do that. All right. Um, all right. Uh, next up, uh, Rahul wrote, uh, wishing you uh, happy holy uh, from India. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah. Separately, happy Ramadan. Uh, I forgot to mention that a couple weeks ago uh, for, for our friends that, that celebrate Ramadan. Okay. Uh, Lay wrote, good morning. And thank you for the, the emoji. God bless you. Uh, next up, questions from Ryan, which is, how would you allocate your cash in a portfolio. There's T-bills, CD ladders. Is there a simpler low expense ratio ETF out there that, accomp that could accomplish the same? Yeah. So a couple of things. When it comes to portfolio management and creating your portfolio, I don't recommend having more than 5% of your liquid net worth, meaning your portfolio, your cash portfolio. Don't have more than 5% in any one particular stock. Okay. That means that if you're going to own stocks and have a portfolio that consists only of stocks, you got to have at least 20 stocks, okay? And that's proper risk management. In addition, I don't recommend having more than 20% of your portfolio in any one particular sector, like technology or healthcare or, or cyclical stocks like Caterpillar, et cetera. Now, in terms of, of owning fixed income instruments, it all depends on what your risk appetite is. And there's an old school private wealth management train of thought, which is this. You take 100 minus your age, and that will help you understand how much risk should be in your portfolio and how much, how much you should have in AAA rated bonds. So if you're 80, then 100 minus 80 is 20. And that means that only 20% of that portfolio should be in riskier stocks, right? Growth stocks. 80% should be in lower risk treasuries or AAA rated uh, bonds, et cetera. So that's, that's how I think about it. Now, the exception to that uh, from a portfolio construction perspective is if you buy massive lower risk ETFs like the S&P 500. I don't mind having 20% of my portfolio in one ETF, which is ticker VOO, -O -O, the S&P 500 ETF. Yeah. And I don't recommend buying single stocks actually, unless you do your own research. Otherwise, just buy ETFs. 
So how do you do research on a stock? Well, in my MBA degree program, uh, I explain this in a lot of detail. Okay, I provide you with tons of templates uh, in terms of how to analyze any company or do anything you want in business. So what I do is I analyze, and, and I give this to my MBA students. This is a 100-step outline of how to invest in stocks and do research. There's qualitative research steps up here, right, like the management team, company history, etc. There's quantitative research steps here, like the total addressable market, market growth, market share, etc. Then there's financial research down here, right, where I actually help you build the income statement, um, cash flow statement, balance sheet, uh, and then value the company using three different valuation methodologies, price to earnings, price to revenue, and DCF. And once you complete this entire research process, and every single tab has a, a video to link from uh, on, on YouTube, uh, unlisted video, okay, in the, in the 20, 20th row or so. Once you complete it, then you've got an executive summary, a one-page executive summary. And this is a dummy data right here. Right? You can print this out uh, if you want to. And it's based on all the fields that you enter into this document. What also comes out of this is a 100-page uh, investment research report and, of course, a nice pretty dashboard uh, that I make as well. And I also teach Excel in my MBA degree program. So make sure you have a process in place. If you don't have a process in place to do really, really deep due diligence on individual companies, then don't buy individual companies. Buy ETFs instead. Okay. And nobody is smarter than you. Always do your own research. Never rely on anybody, myself included, when it comes to buying stocks. Otherwise, you'll sell at the worst time. And Warren Buffett once said that the New York Stock Exchange is the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff and it goes on sale. Think about that. That's why you, you got to be long-term focused and do your own research. My teeth are finally getting whiter because I've been using a straw for about six months now. My coffee. I love my coffee. Sometimes when I go to bed, I'm just about to fall asleep. I tell myself, I can't wait to get up to have my coffee. Yeah. Okay. I don't smoke or I don't drink. So that's... that's that's my advice. All right. Okay, next question is from Kim, uh, which is, where do I find uh, uh, Canadian investor information? I'm looking to buy uh, Canadian local businesses. Yeah, if, if it's a publicly traded company, you look at CEDAR, which is Canada's equivalent of sec.gov, Securities and Exchange Commission. When it comes to smaller private companies, it's very, very hard to do. Now, what you can do is you can always partner uh, with a smaller investment bank or private equity firm and look to invest with them, so to speak. Yeah. But it's really, really hard. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, ne next up, Rahul wrote, um, how is digital marketing as a career for extreme introverts um, as a lot of targets are involved, like CPC, cost per click, uh, et cetera. A um, couple of things. Let, let me first of all touch upon the, the extreme introvert comment. Um, I used to be a bit of an introvert. And when I was a programmer or developer, as they say these days, back in the 90s, I spent four years working at Accenture. I would code all day long, and I loved it. I was in a vacuum, right? It was like tunnel vision. And 10 hours would go by, I loved it. But then I would go to parties and I was a little bit nervous talking to people. And the way that I kind of became more of an extrovert is I forced myself to move to open spaces, so to speak. What that means is this. I ran to my fear and everybody's got to do this in business. If you're fearful of public speaking, run towards that fear and present and condition yourself to enjoy it. Perception becomes reality. Like the Rodin sculpture, I think therefore I am. So you can always change from becoming from being an extrovert introvert to an extrovert. You just got to force yourself to do it. Yeah, take a chance. Uh, in terms of a career in general, uh, when it comes to um, uh, digital marketing, so whenever I look at any career or any company or any sector, I always start off with a high-level question, which is this. In five years, will this company or this sector be more relevant than it is today? Think about that. And by doing that, it'll stop you from being seduced to buy value traps in technology companies that are becoming less relevant. Once a technology company becomes less relevant, a little bit less relevant, 99% of the time, it's game over. So I do think that in five years, digital marketing will be a much bigger deal than it is today. 
And if you want to learn skills when it comes to digital marketing, what you can do is you can start playing around with uh, MailChimp. It's free. Then move up to Active Campaign. Then what you can do is you can go to Upwork.com or Fiverr.com and you can do a search on people that are selling their services in Active Campaign and then offer that as a service uh, as well. And that's just part of it. There's a lot more to it uh, as well. Now, if you want to learn more about digital marketing, uh, a good friend of mine named uh, Diego Davila, uh, he teaches uh, digital marketing on Udemy. Check out his courses. He's great because he teaches in three languages too. He's amazing. Guy's amazing. Okay. Okay, next question here is, is from the, the, the Vanquisher, uh, which is, who do I report HR to at work? Yeah, but please rephrase the question. Um, are, do you need to report somebody at work that is, is doing something unethical or unfair or whatnot? Uh, let me know, please. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, when it comes to corporate politics, and, and I hate politics, I can't believe I survived as long as I did at Goldman Sachs. I spent five years there. And after working five years there, and I loved it, after working five years there, I understand why so many successful politicians come out of Goldman Sachs, or any big company for that matter. Careful what I say here, Chris. Uh, but if you're dealing with corporate politics, um, there's always that dude at work that will try to bait you by asking you a question, and it's something controversial. And no matter how you answer it, you think you're going to get into trouble or you'll be quoted. So when somebody asks or says something to you, that is really controversial. Instead of saying you agree or disagree, you say this. I understand. Because those two words right there doesn't mean you agree with them or disagree with them. You say, I understand. It works with dating too. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm going there. Okay. When you get in an argument with your spouse, don't do this, but I'm going to paint a scenario. And if you say, I agree or I don't agree, you're like, oh my God, this is going to lead to another fight. You can say something like this. I understand. Because you're not saying you agree or disagree. You're just saying, I understand. Also, if your spouse tells you this, hey, do you want to have dinner with my family this weekend? If you respond with this, yeah, but didn't we have dinner with them two weeks ago? All your spouse hears is, you hate my parents. Don't do that. And I've never done that. Okay. Okay. All right, next up, Phil Germany. Hey, Phil, how are you, buddy? Uh, Phil wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, I'm sure you mentioned this in the EMS sections, meaning economics management strategy sections of the MBA degree program. But when forecasting revenue, what multiple do we use for future years? 5%, 6%, uh, et cetera. Thanks. Yeah, I answer that a couple of different ways. Uh, in terms of the growth rate, it all depends on historical growth. So whenever you're creating a financial model for, for a company, let me share one of the templates I have uh, for my, my MBA students. But whenever you're, you're, you're creating a, a financial model, let me go over here to revenue forecast. What you want to do is you want to look at historical, historical revenue growth, okay? And whatever you model is historical revenue growth, that'll make it easier for you to forecast in the future. There's no numbers in, in this template here. So for example, when you're, when you're creating a financial model, and it's so much easier to model than you think, but an object in motion will stay in motion. What does that mean? Well, if I take this and I tell you that revenue growth is going like this each year and then slowing down here, what do you think the next data point is going to be? Probably there. An object in motion will stay in motion. So when you're valuing companies and creating financial models, step one is you want to forecast revenue. Spend all, most of your time on revenue. Then what you do, step two, is you make expenses a percent of revenue. And you look at historical trends for the three expense line items, G&A, s and uh, and R&D. And then what you do is you then forecast what your earnings are. So it's a lot easier than you think. And then what you can do is you can apply uh, your price earnings target uh, price uh, based on your earnings estimates in five or 10 years. Always be long-term focused. Now, in terms of what do you do if the company is not profitable? How do you value the company? Well, one thing you can do is you can look at the revenue multiple. Right? So if there's no earnings, you value it based on price to earnings or price to revenue. And the way to think about this is for the rest of your life, when, and I'm a small man, whatever, if you meet me in real life, I'm tiny. And I've used that joke before, but it's so good. I love it. But for the rest of your life, whenever you look at a formula, 
okay? A fraction. Always think of the denominator as one. For example, price to earnings ratio. Earnings is a denominator. So for every $1 in earnings on the denominator, how many times that $1 are investors willing to pay? If it's growing faster, they'll pay a higher PE. Similarly, with a company that's not profitable, you look at price to revenue. So price to revenue or price to sales, same thing, means for every $1 in revenue, how many times that price, that $1 in revenue, are investors willing to pay? And it, it's contingent upon how fast that company is growing, what the market environment is like, and also what are other companies in that sector trading at. And a great example I can give you was from the summer of 2012, I participated in three cloud software IPOs. I met with the CEOs of ServiceNow, ticker NOW, uh, and at that, at that point in time, uh, it was uh, Frank Slootman, who just resigned from, uh, uh, from Snowflake. We exchanged uh, LinkedIn messages recently. So ServiceNow, ticker NOW, Splunk, SPLK, which got bought by Cisco last fall, and Workday, ticker WDAY. And those three companies back then were trading, and they weren't profitable, right, or really on a, on a, on a gap basis when they went public. They were all trading at between 15 and 20 times revenue. And so that's how we valued that sector at that point in time. So the bottom line is, if a company is not yet profitable, use, to pre use price to revenue. You look at the market environment, you look at the growth rate, and you look at what are other similar companies valued at in that sector. And if you have follow-ups, uh, please let me know. Great question. Okay. Uh, and then Phil wrote here, give me a second. Whoops. Uh, later today, I'm taking an AI course taught by Luca. Where can we buy the AI book that you guys wrote? Yeah, Luca's amazing. So if you guys want to learn about AI, uh, t talk, to, talk to Luca. So in terms of the, in terms of the, of the books that, that Luca and I have, um, we don't publish these. These books are available in the course that we sell always. Yeah. And one, a great way to, to think about creating content quickly and monetizing it quickly is you repurpose everything. And so what we did was we took the closed captions. I'm going to teach you how to do this too. We did the closed captions in our course. And then we exported them all into text files or SRTs, right? Closed caption files. Using a product, an AI product called Descript. And then what we did was we put all that stuff into a book. In fact, that's how I built my company from scratch. And I recommend you all do the same thing as well. I recommend you all write at least one article every single week in LinkedIn. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I took all those articles that I wrote over two years, right? 104 articles. And I put 101 of them in here, in this book. And what I did was I, the articles that got the most clicks, views, likes, comments, controversy, whatever, I made first in the book. I sorted it that way. And then I repurposed that content, my LinkedIn articles, into a book, an Audible book as well, and then 78 courses as well. And it's a way to work smarter, not harder. And if you want to learn more, and my dad always told me, only take advice from, from successful people. So don't take advice from me on this. Take advice from Gary Vaynerchuk. Do a search on Gary V, and he talks about this a lot. It's the content model pyramid. And that's exactly what I do with this weekly call. And so I've been doing this weekly call for five or six years. And what I do is the seven best questions asked. They're repurposed into vlogs, Instagram, TikToks, LinkedIn videos, whatever it is. There's nothing left on this weekly call carcass <laughs> by the time we're, we're done with it. Always repurpose content. And that's something that, that Nintendo, um, and I've got a prop for everything. It's fun to teach with props. That Nintendo's been doing that forever. Nintendo is the oldest tech company in history. And it wasn't always a tech company. It was a trading card company for years. But what Nintendo always does is they repurpose their content to the extent that their older games, 8-bit, 16-bit games, or 64-bit games, or Wii, Wii U, Switch, etc., they're repurposed on future platforms. And by doing this, you work smarter and not harder. Uh, and also, your, your margins uh, are excellent if you do that. Yeah. Okay, Manas, how are you? Uh, Manas uh, from India wrote, uh, the U.S. elections are due in... Okay, so here's who I'm voting for in the elections. I'm, I'm going to be voting for there. I'm not saying. And by the way, am I a Democrat or a Republican? It all depends. It all depends. When I was a kid, I, I grew up in Canada 
And I loved Ronald Reagan. I loved everything he stood for when it comes to geopolitics, you know, standing up against uh, filthy communism. Then I came to America and I could vote. And I thought, oh my God, I don't know what I am now. Am I Republican or Democrat? So it all depends. I'm probably more of a libertarian. Yeah. Okay. Your question is, and by the way, whenever you're doing an informational meeting, never disclose, obviously, never disclose or imply which politician you follow. The same thing on LinkedIn. Be really careful who you follow. Don't follow politicians on LinkedIn because half the people will like you more than the other half. I don't know what half. Let me get to your question. The U.S. elections are due. Instability or volatility is going to be there. And also the fact that uh, the market are at uh, ATH, all-time high. Uh, not going to ask who will win, um, but will it affect the markets, both equity and crypto? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here's how I'll answer that question. Okay. And I'm not implying who I'm going to support, but there's a political spectrum. Okay. And on the political spectrum, you've got right wing and left wing. Okay. Right wing, and then you've got centrists. Okay, so you've got Republicans are more over here. Democrats are more over here. Now, let me take a step back and answer the question this way. If a, pol if a country has a politician that wins that is closer to this side, closer to this side, usually that's good for the markets. Yeah. I'm not saying who I voted for. All right. Um, and when I say good for the markets, I mean all asset classes. Yeah. All right. And then regarding that comment on XRP, uh, $2 billion fine. Yeah. Did you hear? I, I haven't looked into it though, but I still own that crypto. And I've disclosed publicly which cryptos I've owned forever, which I haven't sold. Uh, and they are as follows. Bitcoin, Litecoin, uh, Ethereum, uh, and then uh, Ripple, a uh, ticker XRP there. All right. Uh, next question is, how expensive is it to live in the San Francisco Bay Area on the left coast there uh, if somebody earns $100,000, $102,000 annually? And yeah, it's tough to survive. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard. It, it's tough. It's the Bay Area is one of, where I live. It's one of the most expensive places to live uh, in, in the world. It's unfortunate. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons is there, there's just a dearth or a limit of land. Yeah. Um, but I'm not too bull. I mean, I own my house, but I'm more bullish on farmland uh, than I in in more populated areas in the long run because the pandemic taught us that we can all work remotely. And I do own a lot of farmland uh, in Texas, for example, but I gave up the mineral rights. Yeah, it's a cheaper way to, to get access to land. Yeah, but it's expensive, man. Yeah. All right. All right, Carolyn uh, from from uh, from France. Good to see you. Who wrote a good morning, Chris uh, Fisker? Got you listed a couple of days ago. Yeah. So for those of you not familiar with Fisker, so when, when Tesla was first released years ago, the, the Roadster, there was really two companies that were vying for lead in in the electric vehicle market. There was Tesla and Fisker. Fisker was mismanaged to the extent that Fisker actually declared bankruptcy in 2013. Then they relisted. Uh, and it looks like the stock was just delisted uh, again. They're having material cash flow issues. It's tough. And, and the problem with that is that you're probably not going to want to buy a Fisker car if you read headlines like that from a support perspective longer term uh, with, with the car. Yeah. So your question is, um, the ticker was listed as FRSN for one day. What does N mean? Yeah. Stock was moved OT, OTC uh, pink flower. Yeah. So what that means is this. So whenever the stock price on most markets is below four bucks or low single digits, if the stock stays low for a certain amount of time, um, then what happens is the exchange gets worried that, oh my gosh, this company might not make it. It's not liquid enough. So it gets rid of it temporarily. And when it gets delisted, an extra ticker is added or an extra letter is added to the ticker. Okay. So um, if, if, if a company has four letters in its ticker, a fifth one is added. If it's three, a fourth one is added. And that's exactly what you're seeing right now. Um, and if Fisker doesn't you know, get their stuff together and improve their current situation, uh, they won't get relisted on the market. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Darwinism. Yeah. 
All right. Fred, oh my gosh, it's been a while. How are you, man? I, I miss you. Uh, Fred works in the healthcare industry uh, in, in, in DC, I believe. Um, and, and I remember you met with Fauci uh, years ago uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. And thank you so much for sending me that picture of you with, with the rock, uh, Dwayne Johnson. That was really cool. I appreciate that. Um, you wrote, uh, in your hedge fund days, yeah. Did you wait until the last 30 minutes of trading day to make any trades? I heard that was common practice among institutions to manage their portfolio. Only if you manage a smaller fund. Because if you manage a bigger fund, it's really hard to do that, right? Because you're going to move stocks and move the market. Um, usually I would put in uh, mar uh, limit orders and not market orders. So I didn't really care about the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing I did, okay, when, when I managed uh, uh, my fund years ago, so when the market closes, stocks still trade, but they're illiquid. Here's what I did. So Barron's, which is like the Wall Street Journal on Saturdays. Barron's comes out every Saturday. And Barron's is very influential. It can move stocks. And so the paper version of Barron's comes out every Saturday. I discovered years ago, when podcasts first came out, that Barron's would always publish the audible version of, the, uh, the, uh, of, of their newspaper at 4.01 p.m. New York time every Friday. And so secretly I had my trader and he never told anybody about this. But I basically had him stay at his desk longer on Friday, right? Most, most, most traders are, are dinosaur at 4 p.m. That's a, that's a quote from the, the, movie, the movie Wall Street. But my trader would stay. And what we would do is if there was a really bullish cover story in Barron's on a certain stock, and I heard about it at 4.01 p.m. New York time podcast on Fridays, we would buy. And the trade worked out incredibly well. But it wasn't that liquid. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, next question is, uh, you said we would uh, need less oil in the future. Maybe not here is my analogy. Imagine an EV car from number plate to steering wheel to logo to dashboard. All that will be made uh, by crude products. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that's plastic or metal um, is made using crude. Right, so oil is, is a big input in the plastics, uh, metal, etc. Obviously, to operate the, the machinery as well, you, you need oil. But in the long run, that will be more clean tech focused, like like solar. Yeah. In fact, uh, Elon Musk said this recently. This is fascinating. If you create it on a plot of land that's 11 miles by 11 miles, solar panels, that could power all the electricity in the United States costs a lot of money, but it's doable. And of course, we know that technology gets more efficient over time. So in the long run, I do believe that we're going to be less reliant on oil. And there's a very famous Saudi Aramco executive who once said that the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. I don't know what that means, but it made me sound, sound smart. And I'm very well read as well. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Manos wrote, uh, there's a stock called Coursera. Uh, it's made by Professor uh, Andwer and Jay. Can you please check on Yahoo Finance if it's worth the money? It's an ed tech focused on programming uh, languages. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know much about this company, but um, I did sign an NDA uh, with, with Udemy. Um, and so I, I don't feel comfortable offering any insights uh, on that company. And you'll notice I, I never say anything uh, about, about Udemy stock. It just, it wouldn't be ethical for me. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, next up, Phil wrote, uh, similar to my previous question, is there a better time of the day to buy or sell stocks? No, no. It, it all depends. Like Because what, what drives stocks at the open is news that came out before the open or how markets did overnight. So if the Nikkei crashes overnight for some reason, it's going to have an impact on the U.S. markets. Same thing with the Japanese markets. If the U.S. market, especially tech, is down a lot one day, then we know the next that, that night when, when the Nikkei opens, that the Nikkei topics, et cetera, will be down a lot, right? So it's, it's all dependent when economic data points come out before the market open or after the market close. Now, a lot of uh, economic data points come out before the market opens, but we don't know if it's positive or negative. 
like weekly jobless claims or the monthly unemployment report. But companies use your report after the market closes, yeah. Or BMO sometimes if they're in Europe, like SAP, before the market opens. All right, uh, next up I've got here a question from Manas, uh, which, which is, I'm reading a, a random walk down Wall Street, okay? Um, and you can also read One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch if you want to. It's a great book. And I'll summarize in a second for you. And then your question is, it called Bitcoin a Ponzi. Yeah, that must be an updated version of the book then, because I don't remember seeing that in, in that book when I read it a, a couple decades ago. It called Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme. I don't know why they bash it. Uh, Voluntarily is there, but maybe it, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. So it's, the bears on cryptocurrencies, and the way I look at Bitcoin is, and I still believe, and I've said this forever, that most cryptocurrencies are an absolute scam. Yes. But digital gold, the safest crypto investments all relative, is definitely Bitcoin. Again, this is, this is fake. I'm a fake teacher too. Yeah. Um, and, and the problem with cryptocurrencies in general, and, and the more sophisticated CEOs, uh, like Jamie Dimon, uh, who's a, the brilliant CEO of JP Morgan, um, he basically said, well, you know, we, how do we know there's only going to be a maximum supply of 21 million uh, uh, Bitcoins out there by 2140? How do we know that? Can you prove that? You can't. Yeah. And that's why I always say never make more than 5% of your portfolio cryptocurrencies and never make more than 0.5% of your portfolio any one cryptocurrency. Yeah. It's kind of like buying biotech stocks. Biotech stocks small cap biotech stocks are really, really volatile. Um, and uh, FTX news, hold on a second. Sam, okay, wow. Okay, so FTX founder was sentenced to 25 years in jail. So just, just hit the tape. Yeah. yeah, And his lawyers were asking for six years. Yeah, yeah. But it's like buying biotechs, right? If you buy small cap biotech stocks, you know, a lot of them are going to go to zero. So it doesn't make sense to, to make them big positions, kind of like cryptos. But one might get FDA approval, in which case it can go up, you know, 20 or 30 times. Yeah. So use the spray and pray methodology when investing in biotechs, meaning buy just a handful of them, uh, smaller ones, smaller positions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Next up, uh, Bog hey, Bogdan, it's been a while. Hope you're doing well. Uh, you wrote, hello, professor. Could you rank or tell us your thoughts on target universities in Europe? Uh, UK Continental, uh, thank you uh, in, in advance. Yeah. So generically speaking, I think in my lifetime, only 50 universities are going to make it. And what I think is going to happen is, you know, people are going to tell themselves, okay, I got in this university. It's going to cost me a hundred grand. What's it going to do for me? The price is too high. And so I think what will happen is initially, um, you know, uh, the endowments will be depleted for all major universities. And then there'll be like a, a Hail Mary pass to write, try to raise capital uh, uh, to keep the university afloat from, from alumni. And then people just realize, I'm not going to school unless it's a great school. Um, and so in, in Europe, you know all the big brand names. Uh, there's uh, INSEAD uh, for MBA school in France, um, Oxford, Cambridge, et cetera. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan because a lot of people get into those schools. You know, Oxford or Cambridge are, are people that, you know, maybe their parents went there, et cetera. Hopefully that's changed. I think it is changing. Yeah, especially with the USC scandal from a couple of years ago. Yeah. All right. All right, next up, uh, Nicholas wrote here, do you consider a house an asset or only if cash flow, like Robert Kiyosaki uh, says? Yeah. Uh, and then you wrote, haha. Yeah. Um, I, I, I definitely see it as an asset. You know, it's probably the most important asset you can ever have. Because think about how much money you spend on rent. What a waste of money. And it took me until my 30s until I could afford to buy an apartment in New York City. But I think about all the money I spent on rent, you know, back in my 20s. It's definitely a great asset. Yeah. Also, in the United States, unlike other countries, you can write off the interest on your mortgage as well. And what that means is you should never pay off your mortgage entirely. Yeah. If you live in the United States. Uh, in terms of rental properties, uh, and again, I've got uh, an elective coming out. Um, I've got an elective coming out uh, uh, for my MBA students only um, on real estate. 
And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be showing you a bunch of properties that I bought, you know, Florida, Canada, etc. And I'm going to be teaching you about, about rental properties. And when you buy a rental property, state the obvious, you want to make sure that the monthly rent is more going to, is going to offset, obviously, the, the mortgage payments uh, you're going to make. Yeah. Yeah. And whenever you look to buy a house, house, that's how we say it in Canada, I always want you to think to yourself, can I install a door right there and make that an Airbnb room that will more than cover the rent? Am I allowed to use Airbnb if I buy this house? Let me check the municipality rules. Yeah, from a cash flow perspective, that'll help you uh, long, longer term. Yeah. All right. All right, uh, next up, uh, Phil uh, wrote uh, ETFs uh, like SPLG and SPY are very similar, if not identical to the VU. Would it really matter which one I buy? They're all uh, S&P 500 ETFs. Yeah. So you always want to do the following. Number one, buy from the most reputable company, a company you've heard from, you know, BlackRock or, or, or Schwab or, or Vanguard. Number two, you look at the fees. Whatever has the lowest fees is the one you go with. And number three, you look at liquidity. Okay. And when I say liquidity, I mean, you take the price of whatever ETF it is you want to invest in times the average number of shares tra traded daily. And whatever amount that is, never buy more than 10% of that volume in one day. And I say that just in case you're starting to look at smaller cap ETFs, because illiquid stocks own us in a down market and not vice versa. Liquidity is important. Okay. All right. And so Vanquisher wrote, uh, yes, regarding HR. Let me go ahead and read your initial question. Okay, you wrote, you wrote way, way up here at 801 AM. Who do I report HR to at work? And then I ask you for, for more clarity. Uh, yes, a member of HR. Okay, okay. So a member of HR, you want to report an HR member to somebody at work. Yeah. <sighs> That's a tough question. Maybe ask your, your boss or colleagues of yours or mentors in the company that have been there a long, long time. Ask them for advice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, every corporate culture is a little bit different. If it's something extremely egregious or hurtful, uh, then you can go to that person's boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and everybody's gotta have multiple mentors at work. I always recommend that you have two, three or four Yodas, meaning people that are, are similar to you, similar life experiences that work in different departments to mentor you. And the best mentor you can possibly have in any company is your boss's assistant. And I say this because your boss's assistant has probably worked with them for many years at many companies. And they know how decisions get made. Yeah. Okay. And then there's a question about, uh, yeah, Manas, I, I, I can't answer that. Yeah. But, but I'll say no. Okay. All right. All right. Um, and let me get to, to where, I, where I was here. Okay. Next question is from Nicholas, which is, what is your favorite valuation method? Yeah. It's definitely price to earnings. So I love to value companies based on my earnings estimates in five or 10 years. Okay. And using P to E is the easiest methodology. And what you want to do is you want to look at pro forma uh, earnings results and not gap. And the reason I say that is because gap accounting includes a, a lot of um, a, a lot of non-cash items. Let me show you a real case example of this. I hate DCF because there's too many unknown variables and because the terminal value calculation is sometimes 95% of the valuation. Plus, if I told you X plus one is three, we know X is two. But if I told you X plus W plus Q plus pencil is three, what is X? No idea. That's what DCF does to you. There's too many unknown variables, garbage in, garbage out. But let me show you gap versus non-gap. Okay, so let's go over here. Sorry for making you all dizzy. Let's go over here to sec.gov. So when you're doing research on a company, you can always read the filings here. So let's look at Oracle. Okay, so Oracle, big database company. And let's look here at 8K. Okay. So companies report earnings usually um, uh, four times per year. 
And we can we see here that when Oracle reports reported, they tell you non-GAAP versus uh, GAAP earnings. GAAP means accounting stuff, like including non-cash stuff like stock options, amortization, etc. GAAP non-GAAP is what finance people look at, which means you get rid of all the non-cash crap. And non-GAAP is usually higher than GAAP. And the best way to understand the differences is you look here at the income statement. Okay, and remember these two numbers here. 85 cents is GAAP, right? What the accounts I could look at. $1.41 is non-GAAP, meaning excludes the non-cash crap, which finds people like me like to look at. So remember those two numbers, $1.41 and 85 cents. So if we go down here to the uh, income statement, we see here this income statement here has 85 cents. But we care more about, and this includes a lot of crap, like non-cash stuff. Or, 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 uh, yeah, we care about the cash stuff. So there's usually a reconciliation table that we can see right here that reconciles the accounting crap, accounting stuff gap to non-gap, the finance stuff. And right here we see $1.41 and here is the 85 cents. So gap, non-gap. And right here is where it's reconciled. We care about this here because it deducts non-cash stuff like stock options. It doesn't cost you money to, to, to issue shares. It will dilute earnings a bit, but it doesn't cost you money. Also, similar to depreciation, amortization doesn't cost you money. It's kind of like a goodwill write down. So the bottom line is I always love to look at non-GAAP. Then what I do is I forecast the income statement, okay? As you can see right here, okay? And then I value the company based on earnings. And this is just one of the many different uh, uh, templates I provide my MBA students. And you can sign up. Our next class starts on, on May 6th. I love to value the company based on, 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 on PE, okay? Which is right here on, on the right side. I think I'm covering up with my face. There's a face off in the corner, said the Canadian. Yeah. Okay. And, and when you guys present, um, if, if you're interviewing television, um, which, which I've done before humbly, uh, or you're doing a, a Zoom presentation, you know, a good Zoom setup will do the same thing for your career as what a, a, a nice Italian suit will, will, will do as well. And so you got You always got to look the part, right? And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this on. So if, if, if you find that you're shiny, like I am, when there's too many lights around, you can always put this on, okay? And for those of you who've never done this before, and I had asked my wife for, for help with it, um, what you do is you go to the drugstore, okay? And then you ask somebody at the drugstore uh, for powder, stay matte, it's called by, by Rimmel, right? That matches your skin color, okay? These come in different shades. And get one of these brushes from Sepahora, and then you put it on like this. And the reason why it's almost out, I go through these things fast because my nose is huge. It takes me 8 million hours to put stuff on my nose here. So what you do is you go like this, and make sure you use a towel. You go like this, and you'll see the shine will, will go away. I'm almost out of it. Never let them see you sweat. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. That's a cheesy quote from a Head & Shoulders commercial circa 1985. All right, don't forget the towel. And what you can always do is uh, you can get one of these things and just kind of get rid of the lint and stuff. Okay, maybe I'm beautiful, maybe it's Maybelline. And please tell me somebody on this call got that reference. I'm dating myself there. Okay. And then Manas wrote, I understand. Now I'll say that forever. Yes, I understand. It works. Okay, I, I have to, I am so honest with all of you. And this is terrible. And, and you're probably going to never watch me again. Transparency builds trust. You know where I got that from? I understand. I got it from watching Two and a Half Men from Charlie Sheen winning. Yeah. Okay, next up, uh, Zaid. Hey, Zaid, how are you? Uh, Zaid wrote, and, and one of my best friends, uh, Zaid Ayub, here in the Bay Area, he he owns this company uh, called Saj Mediterranean. Great, great guy. It's uh, it's like Chipotle for Middle Eastern food. It's good. Okay. Um, uh, and I was helping with this marketing campaign. I said, dude, you should say something like this. Our falafel will not make you feel awful. Okay. All right, so Zaid wrote, hey, Chris, all business people and entrepreneurs say, that conventional education is not effective and just a trap to, it's a trap 
like from Star Wars. It's a trap to eliminate uh, corporate competition by the youth. Oh, is this true or is this just a conspiracy? No, you know, I, I, I believe in corporate Darwinism to the extent that, you know, the, the best founders or entrepreneurs or employees at companies will rise to the top. Uh, but one thing that, that, that kills me about big companies is, is politics. Yeah. And you don't have to play the political game if you say, I understand. All right, Mike, how are you? Good morning to you too. Okay, uh, next up, uh, the vanquisher uh, who asked earlier about HR uh, wrote, I'm constantly being, and, and by the way, if you guys want to ask me questions and you don't want your name to appear, you can use a different uh, YouTube account name or change your, your account name uh, on YouTube. Yeah. All right. Um, so the question here is, I'm constantly being uh, harassed uh, by HR, even though I told them I have to travel a long way to work, so I'm two hours late. Oh, there's been no location available near me when I applied. It took three months. Yeah. It took three months for them to stop talking to me like a, like a child uh, and adjust my schedule. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry to hear that. Okay, here's what, what I recommend. So the, the pandemic taught us that we can all work remotely. So what I recommend doing is exactly this. Work exceptionally hard for six months, right? Run circles around the competition at your company, I mean your coworkers. Do really well. And your boss will then say something like this to you. Your name is The Vanquisher. The, you're doing a great job. Great, great job. Then I want you to say it. it's your boss. Thank you. Do you have time for a coffee? And when you sit down with your boss, um, what I want you to do is say something like this, if true. I'm really proud of you know what we accomplished as a team. We've accomplished a lot. Um, uh, that, that being said, um, I, I really want to be there for my family. Um, it, and I really do believe uh, that I can work remotely. Uh, and I'm really passionate about what I do to the extent that it's not a job, it's, it's a passion. So here's what I propose. I work more hours, but please let me work remotely. Yeah, I, I, I would try that angle. Yeah. Or if that doesn't work, uh, then what I would do is I would aggressively try to find another job so you can be there for your family or yourself or have more time to exercise, etc. And you can join my MBA degree program at this link here. Sign up for the platinum version of the MBA program if you want, um, where I do one-on-one -on -one consulting. You get three hours of one-on-ones. Or you can join my new uh, Diamond uh, Accelerator Growth Program where you get 20 hours of one-on-ones. Yeah. And much more. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Alexander wrote, uh, uh, do you invest in seed or pre-seed companies? No, I don't. Not, not anymore. I used to when I worked in venture capital. And I don't recommend anybody invest in private companies unless you're given an investment offering memorandum I've got an example of, of one here somewhere. Where is it? Oh, here it is here. Yeah. So similar to uh, investing in an IPO, right? This is uh, the Meta S1 investment offer memorandum from 2012. So get an investment offer memorandum and read it cover to cover. And if, and if you can't get one of these things, uh, any sort of investment offer memorandum made by a lawyer that discloses all the risks, then don't invest. And it pains me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If a friend asks you to invest in their company, I want you to quietly say this to yourself. Why am I so lucky to be given this opportunity? And the harsh reality is, and I say this with love my heart, is because nobody else wants to invest. And when it comes to friends and money, it gets tricky. I've made friends a lot of money. I had one friend in particular that invested in one of my investments. He knew what the risks were. Didn't work out for him, and it affected our friendship. I don't recommend getting family or friends to invest in your company or invest in their company. Also, I don't recommend investing in private companies unless you think there's a way for you to get out within five or 10 years, meaning harvest that investment through IPO or, or M&A. Or you tell yourself this, I'm going to invest this amount. It's going to be a small percent of my net worth, you know, 1%, whatever. And I don't care if I lose this money. It's not the other world. So you need good risk management and portfolio diversification. Yeah. Okay. Renvir from Mauritius. How are you, man? Great, great to see you. I'm looking forward to talking to you today uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, in about an hour uh, on our weekly uh, Silver Zoom call. 
Yeah, so Remy Zoom call. Good to see you. Okay. Uh, and then Mike wrote, uh, thanks for all the effort that you put into the course. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. It's fun. I don't have a job. I have passion. Um, you wrote, you're a great uh, instructor. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, then you wrote, what's the difference between basic EPS uh, and diluted EPS? Yeah. So diluted EPS means uh, if, you know, if, if all shares are being traded, like stock options issued, debt converts into equity, et cetera. Right. And so that's whenever you hear the word convert, that means debt, usually debt that converts uh, into equity. Yeah. And sometimes a lot of people that or sometimes people that, that run private companies say they want to raise, I don't know, money, a couple million bucks every two years from a venture capital firm to do the A, B, C round. But let's say that they're in between rounds A and B and they're like, oh, my gosh, we just had a whiff yo moment, which means we're we're screwed. It's over. They might need to raise capital. But they're not ready to for the sales cycle of being able to go to venture capital firm yet. So in between the A and B round, they raise debt. And that debt converts into equity in the next round. And it usually converts at a 20% discount to whatever the price is going to be in the next round. Yeah. And that will help you understand diluted uh, shares as well. Okay. Uh, Renvier wrote, I was just checking the Reddit IPO and its investment uh, memorandum. I noticed the shares recently dumped. Could it be insider selling? And if yes, could that be a bad sign? No, it's not insider selling. And I'll tell you why. Okay, so um, when, when it, and, and the Reddit IPO did incredibly well. I think it popped the usual 30, 40% or 50% day one, right? So just consolidating lower right now. Insiders are not allowed to sell. The way it works is this. And I've been an insider before. Uh, and when my portfolio companies have gone public, um, I couldn't sell right away. Insiders are not allowed to sell meaning uh, you know, employees uh, or venture capital investors, until the lockup expiration. And the lockup expiration is, is often six months after the IPO date. And that's why, quite often, you see the price of a stock drop after six months. Now, it's getting to be more of a crowded trade, but when I worked in the hedge fund industry, quite often, if I wasn't bullish on the fundamentals of a company, I would short it into the lockup period because a lot of people sell. And I remember for myself, I had a massive percent of my liquid net worth in one particular stock. And it was because I, I, you know, I invested in the company when I worked in BC. And six months after the IPO, it was a massive percent of my net worth. And I didn't care if this company had a cure for cancer. I had to sell my, stuff, my shares. And so always be careful of the lockup period. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But good for you for even looking at, at the S1. So I just showed you the S1 of Facebook. So when you're doing due diligence on a company, there's the cleaning staff upstairs. <laughs> I specifically always tell them, you can vacuum anytime you want, except Thursday at 8 a.m. Okay. Let me actually use reverse psychology. Okay, so what, what you do is this, okay? So you, you type in uh, Reddit, is it R-D-I-T? R-D-D-T? Here it is here, yeah. Okay. Then what you do is you look at the S1. Okay. Now the S1 is the investment offer memorandum, similar to that Facebook one I showed you a minute ago. Whenever you see letter A, that means an amendment to that. So you look at the most recent one. This is the most recent S1 right here. And you can read through all the risks here uh, on the company and learn a lot more about the company in terms of number of shares offered and all that stuff and who led the IPO, which is Morgan Stanley, who's top left here, for, for example. Yeah. And you can do a search for the word risk and there's 161 matches here. So you can go through and read all about the risks before you invest. Most people don't do this, but I recommend that you do. And then Gray wrote, wait until after the election and say you voted for the winner. It, make, <laughs> it makes you look more successful. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. That's just like me saying... I invest in NVIDIA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Okay, next question is from Justin who wrote, how do you think AI will pan out? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's going to be incredibly disruptive, but additive to all of us if we choose to embrace it, right? We have to try to disrupt ourselves before somebody else does, competitively speaking. So a lot of people are, are worried about AI. Now, the only concern I have about AI is not replacing jobs, because I think we will adapt. We always do as humans. You know, think about back in the 80s when robots were in factories with cars and we were all 
worried that r- robots were going to take our job. I should just get uh, one of those robot vacuums instead. Yeah, crazy. Sorry about that background noise. Yeah. Uh, but people, you know, back in 1999, uh, when, Go- when uh, you know, uh, Google was in beta, uh, a lot of teachers, a lot of people are like, oh my God, this is going to destroy so many jobs. Same thing, Wikipedia was released in late 2001. People are like, oh my gosh, this is going to replace a lot of websites. It's going to replace education as well. No. And those same naysayers, the same Luddites, are, are basically saying that, oh my gosh, AI is going to replace all of us. It's not. Things are never as bad as you think. It's going to be additive to us so we can accomplish much more with less. And so when it comes to my market, for example, I use a lot of AI products to streamline my operations. It's great, man. For example, I used to pay Rev.com a thousand bucks a month to do my, my transcripts and, and closed captions. I now pay 20 bucks a month using Descript, which is built on top uh, of, of ChatGPT. But in my industry, I think it's only a matter of time until products like Sora, which is video-based uh, AI product in beta uh, from OpenAI, until Sora will start to cannibalize my share, my market. But instead of freaking out about that, I can embrace the change to the extent that you'll be able to take courses of mine or learn from me, you know, many years from now, but when I'm not around, using Sora. It's additive. And when I edit my videos and I drop a new um, uh, video on my YouTube channel uh, every Friday at, at 9 a.m. Pacific time. But when I edit my video, videos, I hate paying Adobe for all of their clip art or clip art videos. It's criminal. It, it is what it is, but it's a good product. But I don't like spending money on that. Eventually, I'll be able to do that with Sora. So that will save me money as well. So I'm excited about AI. Now, Sora has had such a profound impact on, on, on the media industry and what I do is media as well. Such a profound impact that Tyler Perry, he was um, about to build, a, spend a billion dollars to build a studio in Atlanta, Hotlanta. And once he saw Sora, he put that studio on hold because this changes everything for the entertainment industry. You know, why do I have to pay, you know, a ton of money to, to hire Tom Cruise, $50 million per movie, whatever it is. When I can create an avatar and own the IP for that avatar and save 50 million bucks, it's going to happen. And it's scary because it, it's starting to happen. Like on my TikTok channel or TikTok feed here, I don't know why, but lately I've been getting a lot of videos for girlfriend avatars. It's the weirdest thing. And I was curious about it. So I clicked on it to investigate in more detail. And now I'm getting tons of them, which is not, not cool. Right. And MBA does not stand for married, but available. Okay. That's good. But these avatars, they're, they're women that, that look almost lifelike. And these avatars, it's bizarre, but they're so lifelike. And you can subscribe, and I never have, never will. You can subscribe and have a digital girlfriend. It's weird, man. But that's what's coming next. Yeah. And to really understand the impact of that is... You can watch two movies. One is Blade Runner 2, where you had that 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 uh, avatar of that woman that was that, that guy's uh, girlfriend, uh, Ryan Gosling, who was born in London, Ontario, like I was. And you can also watch the movie Her with Scarlett Johansson, Wilkin Phoenix. Can't say his first name. Yeah. It's only and, and what's scary is, I don't know if you guys have played that video game, Detroit Become Human. Please play it. It's, it's a great game. And you'll really learn about the future as well in terms of avatars. So Detroit Become Human, it's made by Quantic Studio, I think. Yeah, yeah. So in in this game, what you do is you're an avatar. And in between the levels, right? It is it is brilliant, brilliant game. In between the levels, and this here is uh, Derek, Derek Jeter's uh, ex-girlfriend. She's in the game. But in between levels, at the cutscenes, you're asked a question. And... Thousands of people that are playing at the same time as you are asked a question. And you see everybody's answer. Not their names, just the, what, how they answered. And one of the questions when I was playing was, would you ever date an avatar? Like a real life human being, like a robot, all that stuff. And 75% of the people that were playing online, which is two or 3,000 people at that point in time, said yes. It's crazy. Yeah. So anyway. I really do believe that AI is going to be very disruptive. Yeah.
Yeah. But as, as Warren Buffett said, once you open uh, AI's Pandora's box, it's, it's too late. You can't go back. So I think that we need to have precautions in place. You know, every single country needs to have a department of AI ethics and every single large company needs to have a chief AI ethics officer like Dell Computers done recently. Yeah, or Dell Incorporated. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next question is, what is the difference between EBITDA and normalized EBITDA? Yeah, and for those of you not familiar with EBITDA, it stands for Earnings Before I Tricked Dumb Accountant. Earnings Before Interest, Taxes, Depreciation, Amortization. Okay, so the difference is cash flow, right? It's kind of like I was showing earlier with respect to gap versus non-gap. Normalize gets rid of non-cash crap and stuff that's not repeatable. For example, if I'm analyzing the financial statements of a company, and I know, this is a crazy example, but I noticed that net income increased 500% in one quarter because that company, a tech company, found oil on their land and they got rid of all the oil. That's, you got to ignore that stuff, right? That's not normalized. Normalized would get rid of that. Okay, and then Tento wrote, uh, what are the most important qualities? To, uh, but I love how your, your, your name there is Nintendo, but you spelled it differently. By the way, when the Nintendo Switch came out, I used Game Theory. Um, at my, my kids wanted it, so did I. And we couldn't find it anywhere. It was sold out, it was like 800 bucks. So what I did was I went on eBay and I spelled Nintendo wrong, Nintendo Switch wrong. Uh, and I was able to buy it for next to nothing. And I do that with hockey cards, like Wayne Gretzky with an S instead of a, a Z. Damn, I gave it away. Um, so what qualities you look for, uh, in, in a public company? Yeah. I, I always start with the management team and most people don't do that. They look at the risk, they look at the valuation, they look at this and that, but you're investing in people. And I never invest in a company, almost never, uh, in a tech company when the founder is left. Yeah. So I look at people first. It's more important than anything else. The jockey is more important than the horse. Then in terms of other qualities uh, that I look at, um, if you sign up for my MBA program, I've got um, 101 different qualities I look at in this order. So I do qualitative research, quantitative research, uh, and then financial uh, research. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's like they're done vacuuming. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right, Manas wrote, uh, here's a question. Please explain, GBTC, please. Type this in Yahoo Finance. Explain how it works and what it is, please. Sure, GBTC. Okay, let's do that. All right, let's go to finance.yahoodle.com. Here it is, 25 years. Crazy. By the way, I remember looking at this company Right? I, I didn't have the opportunity to invest. But I remember looking into who the auditor was, and it was a no-name auditor. Never invest in a company, if it's publicly traded, that is, which in this case it was, but never invest in a publicly traded company if it doesn't have a well-known auditor, like Deloitte, ENY, KPMG, PwC, etc. Okay. All right, let me type in the ticker you asked me to do. GBTC. It's in the game. Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Okay. So it's pink sheet. So the first thing I'd look at, okay, a couple things. I don't invest in ETF companies if it's not a well-known ETF brand, like Vanguard, for example, okay? And I think this here is, is Pink Sheet. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel comfortable even discussing this one. Yeah, I, I like to invest um, in, um, and I don't know how credible that this company is. Maybe they're credible, maybe not. I don't know. But what you want to do before you invest in any ETF or any investment is you can read the investment off from Memorandum or the prospectus, they call it, or prospecti, it's plural, I think. Uh, and you can get that from the company's uh, website. Uh, let me let me look here. And you got to question the data and you hope fine. It's not always right. Um, I don't like this expense ratio. That's a ripoff, man. That's one and a half percent. What that means is for every $100 you put in to this uh, ETF, you're paying $1.50 in fees. You know, I, I usually don't invest in ETFs that have fees above 50 basis points. Yeah. All right. Let me look at liquidity. 
very liquid, that's not an issue. Yeah. Okay. Can you break down the best trade uh, you made uh, when you ran uh, your hedge fund? I'll talk about a couple. Yeah. So my best investments are always the ones where I'm very long-term focused. And when I invest in these companies, people on Wall Street and other hedge funds say, you're crazy, Chris. That's a widow maker. Don't invest. And it's good because I'm being contrary. But my best investments are companies that seem really, really expensive this year. But they're not. Because I love to invest in companies I believe are a five by five, meaning 500% return within five years. And in that case, one example is NetSuite. The ticker was letter N uh, until Oracle bought them. NetSuite had a, had a great management team um, founded by people that came out of Oracle. Oracle is a great place to start a software career because there's a lot of tight, extreme type A personalities that I don't mix with well, but they're great entrepreneurs. And a lot of the best software companies on the planet came out of Oracle, including uh, uh, Salesforce.com, which I invest in, Mark Benioff's company, uh, as well as Workday, Soft People, I mean PeopleSoft, et cetera. Same thing with NetSuite. And so the, the reason why I love NetSuite and my earnings estimate was really, really high many years in the future. And people said, Chris, you're crazy. It trades at 200 times earnings. And I would say, no, it trades at three times my earnings estimates in 10 years. It's cheap. And the reason I liked it at the time, all right, back in, let me go back in time, 2010, 2011. Yeah, 2010, 2011 was because I looked at SAP at the time. And SAP, uh, and for those who are not familiar with it, great German software company that makes ERP software. Think of it as Microsoft Office for the whole corporation. You know, you got, you got sales, HR apps, uh, financials, procurement, et cetera. So SAP at that point in time, if I go back in time, is 2010 or 11. SAP at that point in time was an old school client server software company, more or less, that had ERP apps. Okay. At that point in time, also back in 2010 or 11, Salesforce.com did what SAP did, but just for one of their apps, meaning sales. And back then, Salesforce's uh, market cap was $20 billion. Now, what NetSuite did was they did everything that SAP did and what uh, uh, Salesforce did, but in the cloud, right? Meaning all those applications that SAP has, their ERP products, uh, enterprise resource plan, but in the cloud. And so I modeled and thought to myself, well, hey, this company's only got a market cap of one to $2 billion. Why can't this company have a market cap in between Salesforce and SAP? And then I created my financial model. My estimates were way above anybody else's. I didn't care what the street was thinking anyway. Uh, and it was a home run of investment. Other investments of mine that worked out incredibly well uh, include LinkedIn. To, and the, the best companies that are cheap get acquired eventually because the investment bankers, bankers uh, that partner with large cap companies that buy these companies really understand what I'm about to sell you. They understand the long-term earnings power of companies. The longer you view, the wiser the intention. Uh, and so I invested in LinkedIn and it broke my heart when it got acquired in the summer of 2016. But LinkedIn, I thought it could become a trillion dollar market cap when I invested in it because they had no competition. They still don't. And Microsoft, when they bought that company, LinkedIn, in the summer of 2016, They've really done nothing with the asset. And that's, that's typical. Big company buys a smaller company, innovation dies. But I love that company. And my target price was ridiculously high. And I did well with it. Uh, another company I did well on was Amazon as well. Um, a lot of people would say, you're crazy. It's a widow maker. It's trading 100 times, 100 times earnings. Many years ago when I bought it. And I said, no, it's trading at three times my earnings estimate in five or 10 years. Now that Jeff Bezos is gone, though, I don't want to invest in that company. So anyway, those are just some examples. Another example of, of a trade I really well on uh, was eBay. Um, and, and it was kind of a sum of the parts valuation story for me there. So what, what happened with eBay was it was really undervalued for a long time. Because you're either a growth investor or a value investor. You're not usually in between. A growth investor likes to buy expensive stuff that's growing. Value investors like to buy cheap stuff that will do well in a recession, that's probably not growing that fast. And investors really confused with, with eBay. It was really undervalued because eBay was two companies back then, you know, a decade ago, whatever it was. And, and actually I worked at Goldman Sachs in 1998 when eBay went public 
and I was on the trading floor at 10 a.m. I think it was October 1998. Pierre Omijar took his girlfriend and kissed her and high five Meg Whitman at the time the traders went nuts. It was awesome. So I know a lot about eBay. But growth investors hated eBay because they loved the PayPal asset that was growing fast. Value investors hated eBay. They loved the auction business, but they hated the expensive PayPal business. And so what happened was an activist investor named Carl Icahn came along and he muscled his way onto the board, right? He bought a big stake in the company, 30% or whatever it was, I can't remember. And when you do that, when you buy a big stake in the company, you can join the board quite often. And he joined the board and he pushed out, you know, John Donahoe, who's the CEO, really good guy. I like John, I met him a number of times, really tall guy. Um, and he restructured the company to the extent that he broke it up into two companies and he unlocked shareholder value. Part of the company was PayPal, right? Which became publicly traded. Growth investors loved it. Stock went up. And the other part was the sleepy marketplace auction business, separate traded entity, which value investors loved and pushed the stock up. And so both stocks and some, some of the parts was much higher. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about private equity in general, right? Um, what you can do is you can watch a movie called oh, Other People's Money with Danny DeVito. It's an, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Okay. Uh, Ren Beer wrote, how can retailers uh, trade after hours? Yeah, you should be able to do it through the blotter, whatever system it is you're using. Or what you can do is call the company uh, that you trade through and ask, can I trade after hours? Yeah. If you're going to do it, please use uh, 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 limit orders, not market orders. Because after hours, stocks don't trade that much. The difference between the bid and the ask is so wide, you can drive a truck through it. Yeah. Limit orders, not market orders. And then Manas wrote, uh, uh, so basically hedge funds are traders uh, like that, that TV show Billions. Yeah, the successful ones are not. The most successful hedge funds are long-term focused. I know it's a weird thing, but it's true. They make three to five year bets. Doesn't mean they'll keep it on for three or five years because of volatility, but they make three to five year bets. Uh, and so the hedge fund industry is really pioneered by Julian Robertson uh, back in the 1980s. God bless me, he passed away. But Julian Robertson started a hedge fund called Tiger. And Tiger was so successful as a hedge fund because they were long-term focused. In fact, it was so successful that a lot of companies were founded based on ex-employees of Tiger. And we call those Tiger Cubs. And they all use a similar methodology. I mean, they're long-term like Julian Robertson. And so examples of Tiger, Tiger Cubs uh, include uh, Lone Pine, Maverick, uh, there, there's tons of them. Just do a search on, on, on tiger cups. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Ren Beer said, can you please explain uh, the basic principle of market maker? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of an old school thing. Um, like on the, like the New York Stock Exchange trading floor shouldn't really exist, but it's good for marketing. But basically a market maker, best way to explain it is you, you go to the market and, and you want to buy, you want to buy fruit, right? And so, Basically what, what they do, but, but the, the person you buy fruit from can also buy fruit from you, right? So what they do is they buy it from you at a lower price and they sell at a higher price, like arbitrage, right? And the less liquid uh, an instrument is, meaning the lower the, uh, the number of shares at trade or volume, the wider this can be. So that's kind of how to think about a market maker. Yeah. Yeah. Now, retail investors can sort of be a market maker uh, in the options market when you underwrite or short or sell options. That's the same thing, but please do not do that. And I can explain why if you want me to go down that path. Yeah. Okay. And then Manas wrote, I read all the, uh, the books from, from Peter Lynch. Thanks. Oh yeah. I was going to summarize this. I'll do this quickly. All right. So Peter Lynch, who is one of the best portfolio managers in history, he worked at Fidelity they're on their flagship Magellan fund, a, a growth fund. He did really well in the eighties and nineties. And my, my old boss, Carson Levitt used to work for him. Uh, and so what this book says is invest in what you understand. That's basically it. You know, and try the product as well. You know, a lot of people have made a lot of money. That's my son. <laughs> a lot of people have made a lot of money on Apple because they try the product, right? And they, they're like, oh my gosh, I, I like this company. I use a product. I believe in it. I'm going to own it for long term. And Peter Lynch did this as well. Uh, and he also gives examples of his wife. Um, he and his wife invested in this pantyhose company because she used the product and the pantyhose came uh, in this egg-shaped carton, 
right? Because she used the product, you know, they, they invested. And I remember that story because my mom used to use those egg shake products. It's plastic case. And I used to put my Smurfs or Smurfs for, for Europeans there right, in those things. My Smurf collection. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Devon, hey, Devon wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Uh, how are you? I'm always great. Thanks. I, I hope you're doing well. Yeah. Okay. Feels kind of weird wearing a tie here. Yeah. All right. Um, you wrote, my question is, if company sales growth is 5%, does it mean we should give a 5 PE to the company? No, not at all. No, no. The way that you assign a PE is based on the earnings growth rate. So let, let me give you an example. Um, and, and I'm really going to answer this in generic terms. But if the S&P 500, okay, the S&P 500, the average company in the S&P 500 grows at 15%, okay, on average, okay, over, over many years. And the S&P 500 usually trades at 15 times earnings, right? So for every $1 in earnings, investors pay 15 times. So 15% earnings growth, 15 times, remember that. Now, if a company in the S&P is growing at 30%, then it's gonna trade at a premium to 15 times. So it'll probably trade at least 30 times. Let's take this a step further now. Let me introduce the concept of price earnings to growth. So we know what PE is. For every $1 in earnings, how many times that $1 are people gonna pay? If we take the PE divided by the growth rate, that gives us the price to earnings to growth rate. So the S&P 500 historically is say, trades at 15 times earnings and it grows at 15%. That's a price to earnings to growth rate of one, a peg ratio of one. So if you think that longer term, companies should always trade in line with their growth rate, then companies that are growing faster 15% should trade at a premium. So if a company is growing at 50% earnings per year, it should trade at 50 times earnings. Now let's sum this up by talking about peg ratios when it comes to going long and short stocks. Generally speaking, if a stock is trading at a peg ratio of two, meaning twice its earnings growth rate, hedge funds may look to short it. For example, if a company is trading at 30 times earnings and it's growing at 15%, then the price earnings to growth is two, too expensive. Now, if a company is trading at a price to earnings growth rate below one, oh, maybe it's a, it's, it's a good long or, or idea or investment look to buy. So generally speaking, if a price to earnings growth rate based on your estimates is one or below, it might be a good stock to buy after you do your research. If it's above two, then it might be too expensive to buy. And then uh, Manas wrote, even in jail, I guess you're talking about uh, Sam, the, the guy that just got sentenced for 25 years. He is selling cryptos and giving tips like Solana Coin and others. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. I've been to jail. That's that's actually how I learned uh, how to speak in public. Uh, and I was uh, through my church. I was a, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I would present uh, in, in jail and just help these poor kids had deadbeat fathers. It's not fair. Everybody deserves a second chance. Yeah. I spend time in jail. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Devon wrote, um, if there was no Bitcoin, then then gold was trading at $70,000. It's going to be hard for government to load up the truck with gold. What, what are your thoughts on this, please? Yeah. So the US dollar used to be based uh, on silver. Then it was based on gold. And then... After World War II, you know, America realized that, oh my gosh, they can, there's so much business being the bankers of the world, helping Europe to, you know, grow again. Uh, and then by 1972, the year I was born, 8 million years ago, uh, President Richard Nixon, remember that guy? I'm not a criminal. <laughs> President Rich, Richard Nixon, he took the U.S. dollar off the gold standard. So from 1972 until today, the U.S. dollar is based on the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Yeah. Now, in terms of what do governments do with gold? I mean, the United States government still owns a ton of gold in, in Fort Knox. But gold is, it's kind of a hedge. 
Um, and and in, in countries like like India, it, it's used a, a lot more than other countries as well. So it's it's a regional thing too. Um, but it's kind of a hedge, a fear hedge, right? And so I think one of the reasons gold will do exceptionally well longer term, longer term, is because governments like China probably don't want to own as much U.S. dollars or U.S. treasuries or U.S. bonds in the long run. So what do you buy then? They're not going to buy the ruble. They're probably going to buy you know something that's a flight to quality, like more of this. Right? It's a good store of value. And I think in the long run, there's going to be a correlation between Bitcoin and this. Yeah. Okay, and then Joshua wrote, what's an effective strategy to build a virtual goods model app? Yeah. So failing to plan is plan to fail. Always, always, always write a full business plan. And I teach that in the venture capital bootcamp portion of my MBA degree program. You can sign up today. Today is, tomorrow's the last day to get, I think tomorrow the, the $1,000 off uh, uh, coupon expires early bird. But basically what I do in my MBA program is I provide you with so many templates to help you <coughs> launch your company. Okay, so this here is part of the venture capital bootcamp where I teach you how to write a business plan from scratch, uh, as well as how to consolidate your financials, explain your story to investors, uh, all that good stuff. Failing to plan is plan to fail. Always write a business plan. And the way you know you have a, a good business plan, or relatively speaking, a good business plan, is if you finish the business plan. And I provide this to my students as kind of like a safety net. right? I want you guys to do the work. Kind of like, I don't want you to buy stocks until you've done an investment write-up uh, on stocks, for, for example. <clears throat> the outlines, you know, fundamentals, valuation, technical analysis. The way you know you have a good business plan, relatively speaking, is if you finish it. If you start working on a business plan, and I ask you 700 questions or so in my MBA program in the third semester to help you make your business plan. If you start working on your business plan and after two hours of writing, you're like, you know what? This is not the best business model anywhere. Quit. Move on to something else. Yeah, you only have to be writing business one time. The way you know you have a decent business plan is if you finish the entire business plan. Yeah. <clears throat> and then Renvir wrote, Haroon University will definitely be in the top 10. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Two thirds of Harvard Harvard Business School or HBS is BS. Or is that Haroon Business School? Two thirds. I, I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Give me a second here. Okay, there's a lot of questions today. I, I won't be able to answer them all. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> but if you're in your, my, my Silver MBA class, uh, I'll be holding a Zoom and I do it after every single weekly call. It's a one hour Zoom uh, at 10 a.m. If you're in my Silver MBA, you can always go to the very first lecture of your curriculum and click on the link uh, for the Zoom call. That's every single Thursday uh, between uh, 10 and 11 my time, meaning in 18 minutes. And if you're in my Gold or Platinum MBA program, uh, my weekly office hours, it's a two hour Zoom. It's every Thursday from 11.20 a.m. to 1.20 p.m. Uh, and if you're in Platinum, I, I do one on one, so you know all that good stuff. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, next question is Manas wrote, if insiders like a director or a CEO sell stocks in millions consistently, does it mean an exit or something else? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a couple ways to look at that. Um, if a C-level executive, meaning a CEO or a CFO, sells 50% of their owning in the, in the company, and it's all publicly disclosed on sec.gov through what are called form fours. If they do that, that is a red flag, right? However, because executives at companies, especially founders, have a massive percent of their liquid net worth tied up in the company, if they had planned sales that were set in advance, like 10B5, uh, like they sell, I don't know, 0.01% of their holdings every month is planned sales. That's okay. That, that is no indication that bad stuff is coming. It's when they do big sales. Conversely, when they do big purchases, that's a big deal. Like when Elon Musk backed up the truck and bought tons of shares uh, in Tesla in March of 2020. That was positive. And you can always run a, a regression analysis uh, to see if there's a correlation. You can do this in Excel, and I can show you how if you want me to. You always run a regression analysis to see if there's a correlation between massive insider buying and the stock price historically, 
or if there's correlation between massive insider selling and the stock price historically. And this is called behavioral finance. Now, uh, and I think it was Dick Fuller uh, got a Nobel Prize in finance for this. And he runs Fuller and Taylor, which is a great mutual fund out here in the Bay Area. My, my, one of my best friends growing up works there. But behavioral finance means, is there a relationship between insider selling and the stock price? And people usually vote with their wallet. And I remember I used to invest uh, and I'd meet with uh, a lot of times meet with Bobby Kodak, who is the, uh, the CEO and founder of Activision, ticker ATVI, which Microsoft now owns. And whenever Bobby would buy a ton of shares, like real, a lot of shares, one year later, almost all the time, most of the time, the stock was higher. And when Bobby would sell a lot of shares, one year later, the stock was a lot lower. And I remember I used to meet with him in one-on-ones at conferences. And I'd ask him, and it's very delicate to ask a, a question like this. But I started with this. And this is how you should start questions where you don't want to lead the investor or the, the management team one way or the other. How should we think about the fact that you are currently selling shares? So I asked him that. And he's a funny guy. He said, oh, my spouse has expensive tastes. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. All right. Manas wrote, um, how does Bitcoin uh, IRA work uh, and how do you do it? So you talk to an accountant. Now, you're, you're in India, so the, the tax rules are completely different, I'm sure. Um, and I know there's a lot of regulations with, with owning or mining cryptos uh, in different countries too. So always talk to your accountant. In fact, I don't want anybody in this call to do your own taxes. I want you to get an accountant to do your taxes. How do you find an accountant? Well, there's no Yelp or repository for it. You ask a successful friend, aunt, or uncle who their accountant is and get them to do your taxes. And not getting an accountant to do your taxes is commensurate with doing surgery on yourself. There's a reason why the accounting profession exists, CPA or whatever it's called in different countries, because the tax code changes all the time with new government administrations that are elected. And it, it's just too hard for us me, for me to keep track of what are the new medical procedures or new accounting procedures to keep me in line and get me as much money back ethically as I possibly can. Yeah. And so with our, our, our IRA we set up for Bitcoin years ago, I had an accountant and a lawyer set that up. Yeah. Yeah. And it cost me like 800 bucks to set it up. Because I had to set up like an LLC and all that crap. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and John Zay wrote, uh, nice suit. Thank you. Um, it's fun to play growing up sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you wrote, can you explain safe note uh, and when to use them in, in fundraising? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I'm probably not the right person to ask about this. Um but a lot of people were using that back in 2020, 21, uh, when, when interest rates were basically zero uh, in order to raise capital as quickly as possible to monetize or, or to go public. Yeah, yeah. But if, if you wanna go, if you wanna invest in a company, I, I prefer investing in companies that do an IPO, okay? And not a special purpose vehicle or, or any kind of way to cut corners. And the reason I say that is because with an IPO, what you can do, there, it usually takes, you know, I don't know, six months to 18 months to get an IPO ready. And usually six months before uh, uh, before the stock trades, um, it, this S1 document is available on the website, right? That's how you know companies are going public because this has been filed, the S1. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then uh, Money Brazil uh, wrote, hi, friend, hey. Study Vitra Studios. Uh, you, you, will, you will like it. What is that? Thank you. This is how I learn. When one teaches, two learn. Vitra Studios. Vitra? Official online shop. What is this? Okay. Accept all, of course. I don't know what this is. Office concept. I don't know if this is uh, what, what, what you mean. I'm sure it's, it's it's something else. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, what are the do's and don'ts for financial modeling? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I teach my MBA students this uh, in a lot of detail to the extent that, uh, let me see which template I have right here. Here we go. Okay. So I've got 25 rules right here. Uh, modeling valuation best practices, right? And there, there's a lot to go through, 
uh, with all these based on my experience at Goldman and hedge funds, venture capital, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's something that will take me several hours uh, to explain. Yeah. All right. And uh, Braka, thank you for, for signing up. Okay. I love you, Manas. No, no need to say that. I love you. I'm with you. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, Arrow X Superior Flight um, uh, wrote, um, I saw your email for the MBA program, the sale ending tomorrow. There's no available on Calendly before it ends. Can I speak to you or a team member before it ends, see if it's right for my goals? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll show you how to do it. Yeah, my, my calendar fills up pretty quickly. Um, here's what you do. Okay, go to um, harunmba.com. Uh, and then the bottom right-hand corner, um, what you can do is there, there's a blue button that I'm, I'm covering up. Click on that, and then you can set up. It's a different calendar of mine. Uh, you can set something up. And I think, yeah, tomorrow I've got these slots available. These will go pretty quickly, um, but just sign up for, for, for one of these. Yeah, yeah. And to learn more about my MBA program, just you can go to the FAQ link you, you see right here. Yeah. And this is the ninth time we're doing it, ninth one-year program. Yeah, and I introduced the Diamond uh, Growth Accelerator program as well, which is which is humbly doing really well. Okay. All right, Nicholas wrote, uh, thank you so much, Chris, for answering uh, uh, my, my questions. Uh, you're most welcome. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Uh, uh, then you wrote, I really appreciate the, the time and tremendous value and insight from someone as qualified as yourself. You're awesome. Oh, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I, I love doing what I do. And that's my goal for all my students. Like the reason I, I do what I do is I think of myself as a teacher, as, as a, uh, not as a teacher, sorry, as a waiter. You know, when, when, when you go to a restaurant, you, you don't order everything on the menu, but you look and you decide to order one or two things. So I'm, I'm your waiter humbly. And I want to expose you to all careers and investment categories, et cetera. And you pick what, what you're most passionate about career wise. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully I'm a good waiter with good food. Okay. All right. And I do have to wrap it up in a minute. And Manas wrote, how are your cats doing? Are they pretty big now? Um, you have a cat. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. I got I got two of them. Um, I've got uh, Ruby uh, and then a rescue cat named Onyx. And Onyx is adorable. So he's a really, he was a tiny black cat and he was getting beaten up at night by the squirrels. And we have mountain lions where we live. It's crazy. They come out at dusk. I've never seen them, but it's a great way to get my kids to come indoors. I'm like, hey, get home before the lions come out. It's true. We, we do have mountain lions. So he was a rescue cat. He got hurt. We took him to the vet uh, and then we, we rescued him. He's great. He's, he's really cuddly too. Affectionate. Yeah. I love cats. Okay. Next up, uh, Adamu. First time I've seen you. Uh, welcome to the call. I hope you join us again. Uh, who wrote, uh, uh, hello, mentor, Chris, please. Um, you just mentioned that you like to value company based on PE, but PEG doesn't take into account the future earning. Do you think we consider that the PEG ratio? No, it does. It does. So when I apply, okay, let, let me take it a step further. When I create my, my price targets, right? I usually base on my earnings estimates in five or 10 years. So I'll give you an example and I'll incorporate uh, earnings growth and PEG. So if in year four, there's a dollar in earnings, and in year five, there's a dollar twenty in earnings, and that's twenty percent earnings growth. So what I do is I base my target price based on twenty times a buck twenty. Okay, so that's twenty four bucks. Yeah, that's my my target price in five years. And then if you want, you can use you know, three three month treasury discount uh, that in today's terms. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then Devon wrote, if a company's EPS is $3.34 and the price to earnings is $134 um, and the price to book is 13 okay, sounds like you have a specific stock in mind, and the peg is negative uh, 2. Okay, so earnings is not growing. Okay. Um, okay, so you're saying that $3.34 um, is, is down 2% from the previous year. So the previous year is like $3.50 or $0.40, cents, yeah. Uh, and the industry PE is 59. Uh, the company uh, is increasing its capex, expanding, it's spending more. 
hence the negative growth in earnings. Yeah. Uh, is this possible reason for price spike? It all depends. It all depends. So what you what you're doing there, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm assuming is you're looking at a specific stock based on this year's earnings or next year's earnings. What I recommend doing is build a financial model using the templates I provide you with my program and forecast what your earnings estimates are going to be in five or 10 years, right? Don't just, that's my, I got to wrap this up a second. Don't just look at earnings this year or next year. And don't look at what the market is valuing the company at as well. You know, nobody's smarter than you. Always do your your, your own uh, your own work on this. Yeah, and, and sophisticated growth investors, what they do is they value companies and even value investors, you know, based on their earnings estimates many years from now. And even Warren Buff, who's a quintessential value investor, whenever he buys a stock, he always tells himself, "I'm assuming the market's going to be closed for ten years." After he buys the stock, now he knows it's not going to be closed for ten years, but that's how long term focus you have to be, and you'll sleep better at night as well. Now, you mentioned price to book of 13. So I'm assuming whatever company is you're looking at, it's probably a tech stock. Yeah, and we can't use price to book with tech stocks. Yeah, unless it's a, I don't know, a sleepy old school semi semiconductor like, like Intel. I had a prop here for Intel, but whatever. Oh, I found it. Yeah, Intel prop. Yeah, and I do a case study in Intel, my, my MBA program, that's why. Okay. I'm going to have to wrap up uh, today's call. I know there's a lot more questions. Um, if, if you're in my Silver MBA program, I'll, I'll see you in a couple of minutes on, on our weekly Silver call. It's a one-hour zip. Okay. Uh, go to the first lecture of the MBA curriculum that you can find here. If you're in my Gold or Platinum program, I'll see you today at 11.20 a.m. for two hours in. If you're in my Platinum program uh, or my Diamond Growth Accelerator program, I'll talk to you this afternoon or one-on-ones after. Um, and to learn more about the MBA program, uh, again, tomorrow is the last day to save $1,000. It's early bird special, and prices are not going to be this cheap uh, starting uh, on the 1st of, uh, of April. No joke. Uh, but to, to learn more, um, what you can do is just go to harunmba.com slash FAQ, all lowercase. Uh, scroll down to read about um, the, the MBA programs. Again, this bad boy here is a thousand dollars off, so it's fourteen ninety nine. Uh, this coupon expires, uh, I think, tomorrow. Um, oh, tomorrow actually, yeah, not May thirtieth or March thirtieth. Uh, and this one here is twenty four ninety nine. Thousand dollars off expires uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, it'll be higher than this price between now and lunch after tomorrow. And if you're interested in the diamond program, you can book a call with me. And if you're interested in gold or platinum or diamond, uh, you can click this link right here and, and set up a call with me. Um, I've got, oh wow, only one spot left. So uh, get it get it quickly if you, if you can, yeah. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, Cause I feel bad because there's only one spot left. Um, if anybody sets up a call with me on Saturday, I just added this here on Saturday, I'll, I'll do the call with you uh, as, as well. Um, and I'll honor that that coupon that, that day, okay. All right, speaking of nobody is smarter than you, um, I'm going to end this call in a second with a life-changing video of Steve Jobs that I licensed from the Silicon Valley Historical Association. Um, now, please remember that there's no call next week or the week after that. Uh, I am on vacation uh, next week and the week after that I'm, <coughs> I'm attending a high-level meeting somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So uh, anyway, here is the, uh, the video to end this call. God bless you all. Thank you. And don't worry about anything in life. Okay. It's, stop worrying. Dale Carnegie said, our fatigue is often caused not by work, but by worry. Things are never as bad as you think, ever. And Winston Churchill once said, I once met a man on his deathbed who talked about all the worries he had in his life, none of which came true. And what I do, and this is just me, is I don't worry because God already knows what's going to happen. And that puts me at ease. All right. God bless you. I'll see you guys uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Thank you. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Uh, uh, try to have a nice family life. Uh, have fun. Save a little money. Um, but life that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. 
and you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.